So we will present comments and then invite your comments and questions. I think we will do the order of the biographies you have on your card. So, I'm um, very proud to be able to put in my colleagues here. And I won't take a lot of time to do some critical commissions here. But briefly, Wally Burke uh, and I were in a PhD program in the genetics department a long time ago. Of course, she was much younger than I. And uh, she went to medical school and became an authority, national authority in environmental ethics. She had a history of environmental ethics department in medical school. And uh, we're going to ask her to read off and paint some of the pictures of uh, the, in the ecosystem of environmental research, from means to have informed consent. Realizing that the seven years is 1951, one of the things that we take for granted in terms of patient rights, in terms of engagement with physicians and other health caregivers with patients and families, there's somewhat different state. But in fact, uh, many people in those times would say, Cameron didn't work for so long. It was technology. How do you think about it? How should you think about it? Right? Uh, as as Gil says, it's a very powerful movie, uh, and it it gives us a suggestion of two ethical problems, and and I'm going to sort of discuss uh, why I think one of the ethical problems they point to is a very real, cogent, and important one that we need to think about, and the other may be a bit off topic. Uh, so the one that matters the most is. Henrietta Lacks herself was not told the truth about the fact that tissues were being taken for research. Uh, in fact, no discussion, as best we can tell, as best Rebecca Spook could tell, was ever, ever had with Henrietta Lacks. Uh, and uh, her family was certainly not told the truth. They were brought in at a certain point for genetic analysis, led to believe that the blood draws that were being done were being done in their own interest when in fact they were to satisfy some scientific questions of scientists who work with the HeLa cells. Being lied to is a problem. Researchers lying to patients about obtaining tissues or being less than straightforward is a problem. As you saw in a little uh, notice at the end of the film, we still do take what's sometimes referred to as clinical waste uh, materials that are obtained during clinical care and use them for research uh, as de-identified material, that is, if we delete the, um, the personal identifiers. Uh, and I think there are a lot of scientific uh, arguments in favor of using clinical tissue for research, a lot of potential benefit, very rarely the kind of benefit that is claimed for the HeLa cells. Uh, but certainly lots of benefit from obtaining de-identified medical information and using it for research. There's no excuse for being less than straightforward about it. Uh, so I think pointing to that ethical concern is very legitimate and something that remains a live ethical issue today. The other issue uh, that the uh, film repeatedly points to, which I think is a little bit of a distraction from what I would consider the, the big uh, ethical problem shown by the film, is this issue that the Lacks family never financially benefited from the HeLa cells. In fact, when uh, clinical information is taken and used for research, it very rarely will lead to any kind of uh, financial profit in the way that people who purveyed the HeLa cells did. Uh, Johns Hopkins is, is being completely straightforward when they're saying they didn't make money out of the HeLa cells. It was medical um, supply uh, uh, enterprises that actually developed the cells into a commercial product. Uh, and the issue of whether it is feasible uh, to try and create uh, some sort of business model uh, whereby there might be some opportunity for individuals to donate their cells to someday realize profit in the unlikely event that profit will ever occur uh, is, uh, is very complicated. There is no straightforward path. So if that's a side issue, what's the big issue? The big issue 
front and center in this film is the poverty that the Lax family lived with, uh, the ways in which, as we fully understand, as an African-American family in the Baltimore area, they had limited opportunities for safe housing, limited opportunities for employment, and most important, limited opportunities for health care. That's the fundamental injustice uh, that the Lax family suffered. And I'm a little, I think, concerned uh, that the conversation tends to focus on this very thorny issue of the possibility of sharing profits from uh, uh, medical, uh, biomedical enterprise, as opposed to what I would argue is the much more fundamental issue, uh, which is children orphaned when their mother died early ought to have had uh, more financial resources, their family, as they grew up, ought to have had more opportunities for employment and more opportunities for good quality health care. Uh, the fact that Deborah Lacks, a, uh, uh, obviously a key person in bringing this story to life, died of a heart attack in, at age 59 is a striking testimonial to the health disparities that are experienced by uh, the African American community. That, I think, is the fundamental ethical story here. Uh, that's the, uh, I think, critical take-home message. Uh, it's, it's very striking in the film, not only the, the social burdens that the black family has experienced, uh, but also uh, the contrast, not particularly commented on, uh, between uh, the lives that the Lax family uh, members are living and uh, the clearly very privileged life that Rebecca Skloot, who wrote the story, is living. And I think we can be grateful for her, for the story that she told, uh, but I, I, I think it's over-calling it a bit uh, to, uh, to try and get much mileage out of the fact that she had to extend her credit on the credit cards. She had a passion to write a book. She was a well-educated young woman who clearly had enough resources to fund her passion. And actually, in the end, uh, came to a remarkable success. Told the story that I think we all benefit from hearing. Um, but the stark uh, contrast between the privilege in which she was living and the disadvantage in which uh, the members of the Lax family were living is, I would argue, the fundamental ethical concern here. Thank you, Anna. Gail. And Gail Jarvik is the ornamental trustee, professor of uh, pathogenetics and of uh, the Division of Pathogenetics, renowned unit of this medical school, from <coughs> Seattle, or part of Seattle, and many others over the years. And I think in her remarks, she'll tell us something about the closest colleague of Dr. Matowski, Dr. Stan Gartler, who at uh, ranking two, I think, is still doing great and is a highly prominent uh, personage in chapter 20 of your book. Thank you, Gil. And really, I just do that to say that I, I hope you'll address it the more way I can manage. So Stan Gartler was the uh, first faculty member hired by Dr. Mikulski when he started the division in 1957, and he did work on cell lineages, and he's actually the person as a member of a group who showed that cancer grew from one cell into the, the mass that it grew. It, before that, it was not known that cancer was clonal, but thought that it could have been um, a different origins. And he used that same cell mapping techniques to do a very mundane thing we do in science, which is quality control. And so he was looking at the cell lines that they were growing in the tissue culture rooms, and he started to realize that they may all be the same thing. And so he ordered more cell lines, and he found that they were also, he thought, the same thing. And he also realized that the markers in the cell lines that he was working with were from someone of African ancestry because they had an African-specific marker. Up until that time, it had not been public that HeLa cells were from someone of African ancestry. So he called Johns Hopkins and talked to Victor McCusick, who said, yes, the patient was, in fact, of African ancestry. And so Stan went to a national meeting 
to present the fact that virtually all the cell lines that people were working on, whether they thought they were kidney cells or brain cells or lung cells, in fact, uh, were HeLa cells because they were so aggressive. They referred to this in the movie. They had overgrown all the other cell lines, and so people were trying to publish specific work on specific tissue, and in fact, they unknowingly were working on HeLa cells, and this did not make Stan very popular with his <laughs> colleagues, uh, but uh, nonetheless was a critical discovery uh, using these same techniques that he used to study cancers to help people to clean up the cell lines, and in fact, uh, that is what they're referring to in the movie, what they wanted the children for was to help them figure out which cells were HeLa cells and which were not. Stan, by the way, still comes to work, <laughs> 93 years old, and uh, is still brilliant. So Gail, I'll explain it for everybody. Um, the family, the different, very different members of the family, were quite consumed by this notion that the cells are immortal. And what does that mean about the person, or the spirit of the person? Or how should people even think about this? Yeah, I mean, it's a very moving moment in the movie where they see their mother's cells actually dividing because this is a piece of their family member that's still living. Um, and it's very hard, I'm sure, to understand. You know, as the one brother was saying, we buried her in the ground and she's gone. And, um, but yet these pieces of her are still living. And, you know, it's above my pay grade, the, <laughs> the moral kind of, uh, implications of that. And, uh, you know, the comment about is her soul still in the cells. Um, but it, I'm sure it was a very, uh, very uh, tough thing to process. That, but, but yet we have cell lines of many, many, many people in our labs. And we tend to dissociate it from the, um, the family who that person came from. And of course, many of the people with cell lines we have are still living people, so. So Jay, Jay Shandur is a remarkable professor in the arm of genome science. And if you know about the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, he carries that distinction also. Um, you're on the cutting edge of cancer genetics and uh, where we're trying to take science to benefit patients. So give us a sense of then and now. A sense of then and now with respect to what we can do, we can do to uh, characterize cancers and to help patients with cancers. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think it'd be, it'd be great if you could say that we're, we're close to the end here. I think that the, the, the battle against cancer, if you, you know, I think it's, maybe we should be using war metaphors, but, but you know, at some level of battle, and we should think about it as not a, a decade-long thing or a 20-year thing, but probably something that is going to last centuries uh, to fully get past this, but it doesn't mean that we can't not put our all into doing our part of the battle here. Uh, or getting our, our paragraph right in, I think, what is a very long um, struggle for cancer disease that's been with us for uh, as long as there have been humans. So, uh, yeah, I thought, it, I thought in relation to the, the, the story and, and Henrietta Lacks, I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, how our lab intersected with this uh, a few years ago. Uh, so much like the cells, the, the, the story doesn't end at the end of the book. It's, it's continued to go. Um, so uh, uh, in the wake of the, the genome project, uh, a number of cell lines were chosen for more detailed characterization to figure out what parts of the genome were functional, uh, one of which was HeLa. And so we've been, we, we've been as the royal bee, we've been continuing to sequence HeLa really, uh, in, in various parts for, for many years now. Um, so a few years ago, our group and a few other groups set out to try and sequence the entire uh, HeLa genome, which because of the cancer genome is quite a bit more complicated than sequencing your genome or my genome. And so uh, uh, we, we achieved this in our group and we put together an assembly and we're, we're uh, getting ready to put it out there and we were, were scooped by another group and it was the only time I've ever been really glad to be scooped. Uh, uh, because it, it, you know, this is a year or two after the book came out, and, and I think this, this came in the press that the genome had been sequenced, and, and uh, the family got wind of it through Rebecca Sloot, and I think expressed uh, that they weren't happy about this. And um, it actually, I think, ended up being a, a, a good moment in the long run. Uh, so the NIH, the Francis
Francis Collins uh, was able to connect with the family, and over the course of about six months, um, basically just had a, a, a series of discussions about what was important to them in this context and why they were, they were concerned and what their concerns were. Um, and at the end of this, our, our, our paper came out uh, later that year uh, uh, with, with really two outcomes. One, uh, it was the first paper to formally acknowledge uh, uh, Henrietta Lacks and, and the contribution to the family in an ongoing way. And subsequent to that, papers that use uh, the genome sequence of HeLa are expected to do that uh, if they're NIH funded. And the second outcome was that the, the HeLa genome was put in a controlled repository uh, called dbGaP, where it's not publicly accessible, but researchers have to apply for access to it. Uh, and it's a relatively straightforward process, but the nice thing is that there's a committee um, that reviews applications, and several members of the family are on that committee um, and have an active role in kind of thinking about whether uh, various uses of the data are appropriate or not. And the vast majority are approved, but a few are not. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of meeting the family on a number of occasions in, in connection with that. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, 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 you know, as a, as a consequence of, of all of the, the controversy around the genomes, one of the positive outcomes is that they're now at least had a, uh, a seat at that particular table around some of these discussions. Well, that is a dramatic example of how things evolve, societal engagement. I said something at the beginning about patient engagement, family engagement, even the third generation. Uh, there are opportunities to address situations and to bring new values to the relationships. Uh, Tim Thornton is the Robert Day Dow Professor in Biostatistics in the School of Public Health, and he has has worked a lot about health disparities and differences in uh, genetics in different populations. And uh, Tim, I know you have your own take on this story. Um, I'd love to hear it from you. Great. Thanks, Leo. Um, so what struck me with the US housing and the Internet of Access is really ironic that the cells that have been responsible for a lot of the discoveries came from African American women, but I was wondering who's benefiting most from medical genomics, and it's not African American, um, it's not minority uh, populations. And so uh, I've been thinking about why that's the case. And so the most glaring reason is that African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, Alaska Natives as well, aren't really involved in these studies. Um, so uh, there's a lot of health disparities uh, or a lot of common diseases where minority populations are disproportionately infected by them. But there's another side to this, and that's the medical benefits and a lot of the medicine um, and uh, clinical trials that um, are being described are often not effective for um, minority population. So one that comes to mind that touches me a lot is, um, is asthma. So asthma um, for Puerto Ricans, for example, one in four Puerto Rican children have asthma, African Americans and uh, Europeans actually have a similar uh, prevalence is about one, uh, about 12 percent. And for children, the uh, primary uh, medicine that's being prescribed for asthma is WRO. So has anybody heard of you all? Okay. And so uh, you all is tried, and it turns out that you all works quite well for populations of European ancestry, but for African Americans and uh, Puerto Ricans in particular, I'll suppose on them, it's not effective at all. So, uh, so if you look at the prevalence, for example, of uh, asthma in Puerto Ricans, about 25%. Oh, okay. If you look at the prevalence in Europeans, about 10 or 11. If you look at the abuse and the effect that it has, it's not effective for Puerto Ricans. And so that increases this health disparity. And so we have a lot of individuals who are taking this medication where it's not helpful to, to them. And so uh, even though this population really should actually 
be a priority for medical discovery. The medication that's out there for them to take is a beautiful also bad health risk. And that increases this is health and despair. So for me, um, a lot of the projects that I'm involved with are in populations of, um, of um, diverse industry minority populations. But it's a major challenge for genetic discovery, novel study discoveries in these populations because of these small sample sizes. <coughs> There's not a lot of effort involved in collecting minority populations involved in the independent trials. And so I think until there's a bigger push um, for that, um, we're not going to have, um, we're not going to be able to close this gap um, between minorities um, and minority populations and European national populations um, when it comes to a lot of these um, important diseases. And so um, I just close with saying that, that it's fantastic that uh, Henry of and, uh, and her cell lines have been so um, um, important for a lot of medical discoveries. Um, I just hope that there's going to be a bigger push so that more populations can benefit from these medical discoveries and not primarily European populations. Thank you. What is our plan for um, getting people to the microphone to ask questions? You have one over there. Are we going to walk around with it? Okay. So please, uh, before you show me, let me just ask one little question. Because there's a whole chapter about whether or not her name should have been given accurately. I say whether the patient should have been identified. And this is still a question today. When I had medical education, I heard her name was Harriet Lane. That's what we were taught. I was clearing my office the other day, some old books from like 15 years ago, a book by a woman, woman, woman scientist, called her um, Harry Delaney, still. And what do you each quickly think Hopkins should have done when those reports came around about the story about the cells that were making possible to grow from vaccine, polio vaccine? Should they have revealed it? Should they have, of course, asked the total family? But what do you think then? And what do you say now? Reveal the name or not reveal the name? Reveal the name only with permission? Even with permission? I, I think it's very clear. They should have asked Henrietta Lacks in the first place. Uh, and lacking that because she was deceased and they weren't able to, they should have gone to the family. Uh, and I think there should have been no mention of her name without a full discussion with the family about what the preferences would be. Now, the statistician allowed to be blinded. I don't know <laughs> <laughs> the, the names and it's got to avoid biases. But I think, um, as Blinded mentioned, um, there should have been a uh, procedure where there should have been some kind of consent. Okay. Uh, I, <laughs> I mean, to me, the more shocking thing is that they lied about what her name was. I find that personally more offensive. I think it would have been much better to just not give her name, or as Wiley said, to ask permission to give her name, but to, to paper her over and make her another person, I, I find it's very disrespectful. That's my yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, it's your turn. Um, hands, who would like to start? Over here. Who is next? I have a microphone. Way up there. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, I was just wondering what you all think policy should be having to do with genetics and taking people's genes and their cells to just study them and research them. What do you think policy should be? Repeat the question. Who wants to take it? I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear the question. What should be our procedure when we're interested in taking samples to do genetic studies? Is that your question? Yeah. Well, I, I think we actually have at this point some very well articulated principles to follow, uh, and uh, the bedrock of them is informed consent, uh, which means we don't do research with people's materials without telling them exactly what it is we intend to do 
what the procedures are, what the purpose of taking their samples is, uh, that, that's the informed part of that consent. Uh, and uh, with a major emphasis on what I would call voluntariness, that is, uh, people who are asked to participate in research should always be very clear uh, that they lose nothing if they choose not to. They, they don't lose any rights and privileges if they choose not to, it's fine. If they say no, uh, it's a voluntary act and they know exactly what they're going to do. Let me just add, I completely agree with the principles and the practices we're committed to. I find them unsatisfactory. I don't know how many of you have filled out an informed consent form with four, six, eight, or 14 pages, uh, and somebody's rushing you for a signature, or you rush yourself for a signature, not to mention if you're there with a just diagnosed cancer or some other dread disease, and you shove a bunch of papers aside, how much do you fully understand, completely agree? You know, it's, it's beyond practicality. And in this case, there's a much worse thing that didn't come up in the discussion yet. It was highlighted in the book. I would describe that a little differently. That's that she had two pregnancies with a tumor on her surface. Even though she was seen by some famous doctors at Johns Hopkins, she got as fancy care in name as the, any other patient who came to Johns Hopkins in those days. Um, but she was able to feel the lesion, and whoever did or didn't do her pelvic exam did not. That's the thing. But we miss things these days, also, unfortunately. Next. Hello. My question is about the um, advent of consumer available genetic testing and how you think, uh, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how that changes uh, how we relate to our medical care and how we relate to our cultural identity and the intersection between our genetics, our like personal knowledge of our ethnicity, and the way medicine treats us. So, for example, if someone who does not look a certain ethnicity but has that ethnicity and they know that, how does that change the way they should discuss that with their doctors about saying, hey, I actually have African ancestry, I know I'm blonde and blue eyes, and I'm, my genes say this, so my genes say that. I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on that. You know, you want to take that? Sure. Uh, so I have very mixed feelings on direct-to-consumer testing because I'm a clinical medical geneticist. These are the patients I see. And um, whereas I'm sort of a free the information, everyone should have the information they want person on one side. On the other hand, people come in and they really don't understand the information they've been given. And we have people who come to medical genetics to have their 23andMe explained to them, which is not a really good use of resources. <laughs> sort of a limited resource. Um, with respect to your specific question about how your ancestry impacts your health care, um, you know, probably these small percentages here and there aren't going to have a big effect. There are certain diseases and certain variants that we think about more in other populations, so it, you know, more information is always good in the medical setting, um, but uh, probably that information is not going to be critical for most people's health care. And um, I certainly had a patient just on uh, Thursday who the main, he was not in for this reason, but the main thing he wanted to talk about was why his 23andMe and his Ancestry.com did not match. <laughs> and again, I was trying to short circuit through that conversation to get to the actual medical care. So I, and, and I've also had families where um, we know there is a, um, what we call autosomal dominant parent to child cancer variant sorting in the family. And we've had family members who say, well, I don't need to be tested for that because I had 23andMe and it said I had a low risk of that kind of cancer. But 23andMe doesn't test for that exact thing. They test for common things, not rare things. And so I do also worry about you know, people having a false sense of security by being told they have a low risk of something that actually they are at quite high risk. From. And luckily, you know, if they contact us and tell us that, we can explain it to them. I worry about the people who just don't contact us. If, if, if you know anything about genetics and you want to upset yourself, go look up a company called Soccer Genomics, um, <laughs> where they, they'll, you know, they claim to do some genetic testing on you and, you know, not tell you whether your kid's going to be good at soccer, and not, not only tell you about your, your child's uh, soccer potential, but also 
offer suggestions for specific aspects of their soccer skills that they should focus on. Uh, and, uh, yeah. So there are, there, are, there, are, there are tons of these. There are companies direct to consumer for genetic dating services. There is, you know, eat right for your DNA. And there is actually buy makeup that is DNA matched to you. So these are things that people buy. I wanted to ask, don't you think it would be sensible to uh, have more of a systematic collection of biological materials from patients, uh, especially in cases of cancer where rare variants and so forth might be missed? Uh, I would call it an 18 page uh, form. Would it just be, this is what we do? Every patient is specific. It becomes part of our body of knowledge that helps us cure disease. So, you know, I, I agree. I think there's scientific benefit in that. Absolutely. Oh, sir. Um, the, the question was, shouldn't we just systematically collect clinical material to make it available for research so that we can do, uh, we, let's say, have a comprehensive collection of samples for patients with a particular kind of cancer? I, I think that's a very good approach. Uh, I think there's a lot of value to using clinical uh, care, uh, clinical materials in research in that way. Um, and in fact, uh, there are efforts to do exactly that. I think uh, if you look at that from an ethical perspective, there are two important concerns. One is being very upfront about this is our plan, this is how we do business, this is why we do it. Uh, and uh, I would say as part of that plan, and it might well be a very important way of selling that plan, uh, it would be beneficial to have community oversight, a community advisory group. Uh, the other bedrock, from my point of view, is you can opt out if you don't want to. So yes, we want to collect population-based samples systematically, but if someone just doesn't want to do it, they get a right to say no. Just, I'll make sure everybody knows the story of the uh, community panels that were established here at the University of Washington in 1961, I believe, when Bell and Scribner, pioneering in kidney dialysis, had only two or three kidney dialysis machines, and there were dozens or hundreds of patients at risk of dying from advanced kidney disease. So rather than make the decision himself, or by the hospital lawyers, other experts. Uh, it was thrown open to a community panel with members from the clergy, people from the community, to make these wrenching decisions. But there were many, every patient was worthy. Every patient got consideration. And somehow they made some criteria and used them to decide who should get needed care. Fortunately, technology advanced. One of the machines grew rapidly and then it became widely available under Medicare. But these issues are not brand new. And the notion of how you can engage other people who don't have an immediate stake in the or responsibility for the clinical decision is a very powerful and desirable method. Any other comments on this? No, not that. I did want to follow up on the question earlier about um, ancestry. So there are a number of clinical uh, outcomes where your, your ancestor background your race actually is very important. So one example is warfarin. So um, the dose of warfarin that African Americans typically get based on them just having an African ancestry is much higher, for example, than an individual who is Asian. So there are a number of different outcomes where having information about your ancestor background can be very important to the care. Um, what we're trying to uncover are um, what are some of the um, underlying genetic or genetic factors that are contributing to that. But there are a variety of outcomes where knowing somebody's ancestral background or genetic background can be important. That's one of the area of era of precision medicine where we can take that into account hopefully and improve health outcomes. But but Tim, wouldn't it be fair to say that the goal here is to identify the gene variants and be able to test for them independent of race ethnicity. What we want is a test that has all the relevant variants. But um, 
if we have that, then it's, we're not going to be making our decisions by by race or ethnicity. We're going to be making our decisions by the genetic predisposition. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, and so, uh, but that's we can just just discover it. So, for example, um, going back to the warfare example, um, for assassinators, um, warfare is important for um, like big events. And so, for example, for Alaska natives, um, if you give them, for them, they recommend those to try the FDA, um, a lot of them actually have um, very um, uh, uh, problematic clinical outcomes and they will die. So, clinicians have known for years that, that we cannot give these, uh, you can, for example, Alaska uh, people uh, the recommended doses because uh, of the adverse events. And so, they know to give them a low dose just from practice. We don't know the underlying genetic variants that contribute to that, um, but they do have some information that, hey, you know what, this individual is uh, of a certain uh, uh, group that we probably do not want to start at the higher level, a lower level, but ultimately we do need to take that into account by identifying genetic variants that are involved that. That's all the goal for a lot of work that, that I do. Okay. So my question is um, the lack of people of color being used um, in trial. And as a patient, I don't see a lot of opportunity. When I was pregnant with my daughter, somewhere hidden was a consent for her poor blood and, um, to, you know, to do. And I knew that um, African Americans do not um, get it. And so me as a patient, I had to do a lot and to get the consent from my OB um, for him to do the extra things in order to record blood, and that's donated to the University of Washington. But um, I knew that. I knew that we're underrepresented, and I knew that giving that was a gift um, to medicine. But I only really had that because I was thorough in going through that, and it was just a document hidden, and me having the knowledge that we're not a part of trials and, and, and the importance of the poor blood of, of what you can do. So what does outreach, what does getting more people of color in trials so that we can um, help the health disparities that are happening, what does that look like? Can I point to you on what's going on in the progress of asking the PGR? Well, I, you know, I, I think the, I, I think there's, I, I think you're pointing to a crucial area uh, I, I do believe the National Institutes of Health, which is a major funder of, uh, of research, of particularly academic-based research, is aware of the problem, aware of the fact that there's a striking lack of diversity in populations uh, participating in research that's no more truer than with genomic research. Um, what, what is a, a little bit encouraging is that when um, when uh, people get together to try and develop good efforts to address this problem, they have a good chance of actually succeeding in getting funding to do so. So we've been very uh, lucky uh, to have funded uh, a, a research consortium called the Northwest Alaska Pharmacogenetic, Pharmacogenomic Network uh, Research Network. It's, it's designed specifically to find those genetic factors uh, such as Tim was referring to that would help us to understand the particular dose and medication needs, in this case of tribal communities. So this is a partnership of three universities in the Northwest and three uh, tribal health corporations in Alaska and Montana. Um, what I can tell you, having several so are involved in this effort, um, a major piece of the effort is developing partnerships, is going forward in partnership. This is not universities at the University of Washington, researchers at the University of Washington saying, here's how it's going to come down. It's, it's university-based researchers working together with community members uh, to develop the research agenda. And uh, that's one small example we need many more. Let me just add, I think it's admirable that you knew that you wanted this opportunity and you insisted on it. That is great. Looking at the total population, it is a fact that in cancer clinical trials, only about 5% of patients 
elect to participate in trials. Many trials started rolling and never reached the number to be interpretable. So the effort of everybody is wasted and the development of drugs is delayed. And this is a broad problem of all populations of the army. But you're certainly right that uh, there's no new representation. Even though those funded by the national government, the NIH, uh, are required to make special efforts to the group of the I've got the last question right here. Hi. Um, Better be good. <laughs> I'm a research technician at the Fred Hudson Institute Center in Japan, South Asia, um, and so I find my job to be really satisfying. Um, but I'm wondering that as I personally go into this field in this career, um, how do you? This is for our How do you suggest researchers and perhaps people applying for grants developing friendships? How do you? Suggest that researchers take an active role in answering a lot of the questions that are brought up by, you know, Henry and Lacks as well as the talks played tonight. So, how do we, as researchers, try to change our worldview to address issues of, you know, minority health differences in terms of representation? That's not really what we're doing, but basically, how do we as scientists do a better job of helping people? Um, so I, I'll just say, like, for me, I think I became a better scientist when I started working on projects that I'm passionate about. And so um, now for me, I really want to focus on projects that are involving diverse and minority populations and adults. That's really what I'm doing. And so whatever you, you want to be passionate about, so that's obviously one of the first things. Amen. You know, if, if I could just add, um, there's a lot of conversation as people anguish about the lack of diversity in our research uh, studies. Uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion about we need to promote trust. And I think the, the message to the research community, to those of us doing university-based research, is the best way to generate trust is to be trustworthy. And I think we saw from this movie what some of the components of being trustworthy are. Telling the truth, working on problems that matter, being very straightforward uh, with people that you're asking to participate in research. Well, I think that's a pretty extensive summary of a very exciting evening. We thank you all for coming. Hope you uh, think more about the stories which you heard and about the comments. And uh, have a good evening.